Happy Friday, folks, and uh, welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm Andreas Steno, the senior editor at Real Vision, sending to you live Friday, the 29th of July. We're basically heading towards the conclusion of the all-important Federal Reserve Week, and equities are still partying like there is no tomorrow after this rate hike from the Federal Reserve earlier this week. I'm pleased to join to be joined today by a uh, macro heavyweighter, uh, the founder of Bianco Research, Jim Bianco. Welcome, Jim. Good to see you. Hey, thanks for having me. Jim, I mean, uh, watching the price action this week, equities have been partying since Wednesday uh, after the 75 basis point uh, interest rate hike. What the hell is going on? Oh, I think um, a couple of things. Don't underestimate a short squeeze. About a half hour ago, the Commitment of Traders report came out. And as of Tuesday's close, you had a pretty hefty short in the S&P futures, which are um, now not in a good place if you're still short after Tuesday's uh, close. So <clears throat> there was probably a lot of short squeeze in the market. But I think that what kicked off this rally on Wednesday was when Jay Powell basically said three things. One, he said that there might come a time when they're going to reduce the rate hikes from 75 to 50. Two, he said that they're probably very close to neutral. I mean, I understand why he said it. I just think he's wrong. And we could we could talk about that later. And three, he abandoned uh, forward guidance. So he's set it up that the market is saying interpreting all of this as the end of the rate hike cycle can be seen and it's not too far in the distant future. And it's rallying anticipation of that. Jim, we are currently at 2.5% for the Fed funds rate after the rate hike this week. At least the ceiling is 2.5%. And, uh, and uh, Jay Powell is now talking about being close to neutral. Um, the neutral rate is obviously a phenomenon that you cannot just leave your house and observe. Uh, how do you assess the neutral rate and how do you do it, basically? So let's talk about how the Fed does it and how he arrived at 2.5%. <clears throat> um, the Fed believes that the neutral rate is 50 basis points above the inflation rate or 50 or a half a percent real, if you want to put it in those terms. The Fed believes that the long run inflation rate is 2%. So they then think, OK, if we're at 225 to 250, we're approaching what we believe is the long run inflation neutral rate, about 50 basis points over that number. Now, there's an assumption embedded in there and that that 2% it is the long run inflation rate. I don't believe that. I think that that was, a, that was the case. It ended in March of 2020. We're in a new regime, and that new regime is stickier and much higher inflation. And by the Fed intimating that they're still around somewhere near neutral, he's suggesting that they're still operating with a pre-COVID model, the, mo the same model that gave them transitory last year, they really haven't learned their lesson, and I think they're making the same mistake because we can uh, align it. But I think inflation is a bigger problem than uh, the Fed is is uh, is letting on to, and in most of Wall Street too. Earlier today, we got the latest print uh, of the PCE inflation measure, so the official target of the Federal Reserve. It printed at six point eight percent, and I think we uh, need to head back to the early eighties to find similar numbers, right? Um, if you look at the current inflation and the forecasts made by Wall Street and the Federal Reserve, what do you think of those forecasts initially here? You're right. PC is the highest since 83, like CPI, you know, so you got to go back 40 years to find another number that has been that high. But if you do, if you look at the forecasts on Wall Street, there's a chart we have of it. Um, hopefully we could throw that up there. What it shows <coughs> is, there it is, all those colored lines are Wall Street's forecast going back to 2018. They ask about 70 economists, what do you think the forecast is going to be for inflation in the next six quarters? All the lines converge at 2%. Before, the, before COVID, it was the inflation rate is going to be 2% every quarter for the rest of humanity. Then when COVID hit and inflation dove, it was it's going to rise to 2% and stay there for the rest of humanity. Since inflation started moving up since 4% on inflation. Every forecast has been, this is the peak. It's going back to 2% and it's going to stay there for the rest of humanity. Everybody is of this belief that inflation is permanently not a problem. 
It was maybe the case pre-COVID. They still believe it's the case. Now, this is what's driving them. When the Fed says no more forward guidance, good, Jay, because you watch all the act, all the inflation numbers are going to show a rapid deceleration in inflation and give you reason to stop. That, I think, is also underpinning the rally. Now, what I suggested earlier is I don't think this is the case anymore. I think that we've entered a new economy. We've entered a post-COVID economy. It is not like the pre-COVID economy. And for those who've been heard me before, work from home, a lot of other things have fundamentally changed this economy. Fundamentally changed, it does not mean dystopian. It means different. We don't want to recognize that. We want to have an argument as to whether or not the economy has changed. Raul likes to use the example that this is like the late 40s. I agree with him. It is like the late 40s. The difference is in September of 45, we lost 2 million jobs in one month. We all knew why. The war was over. Japan signed the peace agreement or the surrender agreement at that point. And we stopped with the tank and airplane production. We were happy 2 million people lost their jobs. We knew we weren't going back there. We were going to some different economy. By 1947, no one said, when are we going to be back to 1944? In 2020, we lost 14 million jobs in a month. We are not of the opinion, unlike 44 or 45, that this is a different economy. No, this is the 2019 economy. We're just waiting for it to return. So here we are in 2022, three years later, and we're wondering, when are we going to return to that pre-COVID economy? Not whatever it was pre-2019, don't even send that to the economics department. Send that to the anthropology department. They could study that history. We are now looking at what is 24, 25, 26 going to look like. It is different from 2019. I think it is an economy with more frictions, with more onshoring, with more labor shortages as well, too. And that is going to lead to vastly higher inflation, not 9%, but maybe 4 or 5%. And the Fed is going to have to come to grips with they're not close to neutral. The markets do believe that, as I've often argued. Transitory is a word you're not allowed to say in economics, but everybody still believes it. That's what the forecasts show with the inflation rate going to 2% and staying there. Everybody still believes this is a temporary inflation, not something more permanent. And that's going to be the question for the rest of the year. Does inflation moderate uh, uh, justifying the rally in risk markets? Or does it wind up showing some resilience? Yeah, sure, it might peak at 9.1%, but does it show some resilience questioning whether or not we're close to neutral? Jim, if we look at the current market pricing uh, of inflation, uh, it kind of tends to agree with the forecast that you've just showed on, on, on screen here. If you look at inflation forwards, um, they, they tend to converge towards 2% over like 18 months um, from, from now. And they've done so over the course of the spring and the early summer here as well. What are the ramifications if the market is wrong and the Wall Street economists are wrong on inflation? Yeah, you know, the, the, inflation, the inflation swaps curve has not only been converging on 2%, it's been converging on 2% since 2010. You know, so this is nothing new. It's been doing this for about 12 years right now. And it's, conver and it's consistent with The Economist. Quick word about forward curves. They are useful because they tell you what the market thinks. Whether you're talking about the forward curves in euro dollar strips or Fed fund futures or the swaps market that's saying that the Fed's going to cut rates next year, or you're talking about uh, the inflation forward curves, or you're even talking about the forward curves in, uh, in the tips market. They tell, you what the market. they tell you what market players think. They do not tell you what will happen in a year or two. In fact, all forward curves have a pretty bad track record at ultimately telling you what's going to uh, occur. A year ago, the forward the forward strips, uh, Euro dollar strips was pricing a one rate hike for all of this year, a year ago. How's that worked out so far? So yes, if we wind up not having what the market suggests, I think there's gonna have to be an adjustment. Now, of course it could wind up being exactly right. It could wind up that inflation comes in way higher than we think, or it could come in way lower than we think. But um, to assume that because the forward markets are saying 2% inflation in a year or the Fed's going to cut in a year, that's like saying, 
I, I saw what Wall Street's estimate was for Apple. They don't have to bother reporting. I already know what they are. In fact, you want another example of a forward market? Uh, I just saw what uh, what the London bookies have got for Chelsea Man U. They don't have to play the game. We've already decided what the outcome is. The game is irrelevant. Well, no one thinks that. But somehow when we get to these forward markets, that's kind of the way we think, right? The market says 2% inflation a year. So hey, we don't have to bother measuring it. It's going to be 2% in a year. Uh, so that's why I think we have to watch. If it is wrong and if it winds up staying sticky high, then we're going to start to realize the Fed's not close to neutral. They've got a lot more to go. And in a liquidity-driven, financial conditions-driven market, that could be problematic. It's not problematic now. The market's all excited that the Fed's uh, you know, off, of, um, off of forward guidance, and it's all hoping that it's going to see data that's going to say inflation's going to collapse, and that's going to justify that you know 50 basis points in September, 25 in November, and they're done. And maybe that's the case, but I don't think it will be. Jim, let's allow you to... Re- uh, sort of hypothetically replace Jay Powell as the Fed chairman for a while here. What what do you think is needed to bring inflation yeah, down at this juncture? Oh, uh, you know the the, the famous Groucho Marx line: uh, "Any organization that would have him have me as a member, I would immediately resign from." Uh, <laughs> so, uh, what it need? What we really need to have inflation come down? I think is a frank discussion. It's not even just monetary policy. It's a frank discussion. Let me go back to my 1947 example. We weren't going back to 1944. Everybody knows it. 2022, we're not going back to 2019. The president should stop giving speeches, telling people to go back to the office, which he did. Uh, The the Federal Reserve chairman should stop talking about the long-run rate of inflation is 2%. We don't know what it is. We need to start thinking about why we have this, why we have this chronic inflation problem. And I'll give you one example. Um, I think that work from home, a third of the workforce works from home. What that means is you consume more things, less services, and that again showed up in today's personal income numbers that stuff rose faster than services. We have a chronic shortage of stuff because we're demanding more of it, and that's why we have a supply chain problem. And yesterday, the uh, shipping journal Freightways reported that if you add up all the ships that are anchored off the coast of the United States waiting to unload the container ships, we just made a new high. We just made a new high last week. The shipping problem, the supply chain problem might have been a disaster last fall. It's just very bad right now. But it's not. Sh- so it's relatively gotten better, but it is not getting back to normal. It's not close to being back to normal right now. And this is because we don't want to have a discussion. How do, we, how do we fix this? How does the supply chain fix this? If you listen to Wall Street, the answer is hold your breath and wait. It will magically go away in six months or nine months, the supply chain problem. How about the answer is a trillion dollars of spending in manufacturing and supply chain um, You know, uh, restructuring is how we're going to fix the supply chain. And until we do, we have to be prepared for higher friction costs, which is more inflation, for the foreseeable future. Quick word about shipping. The World Shipping Council ranks the, the, the efficiency of ports, 370 of them. Last place, it, last place is uh, Los Angeles. S- second to last place is Long Beach. Tunisia, Algeria, and Nairobi rank ahead of Los Angeles as far as being more efficient with ports. Algeria has a more efficient port than the, than the largest port in the United States. Which is, which is Los Angeles, which shows you how brittle our system is and why when the economy changed, it can't cope with it. And that's why we have this chronic supply chain problem, which is leading to higher inflation costs. If you look at the current supply chain issues, um, at least the Wall Street economists would argue that it's partly driven by the zero COVID policy of China. What do you make of that discussion, Jim? I think it is. I think it is partly driven by the zero COVID policy of China. And I think they have to realize that the zero COVID policy for China is semi-permanent, if not permanent. It's going to go on and off in China for many years. Uh, Yes, you've identified the problem, and it will also be a problem in 2026. It's not going away. (laughs) China is not changing that policy. They just locked down another million people in Wuhan. Remember Wuhan? They just locked down a million people in Wuhan earlier this week because of four COVID cases, four. 
go ahead. We can all shake our head and I could shake my head with you and go, that's insane. But that's the reality of China. And China has become an unreliable supplier of goods because of the zero COVID policy. They're not going to change it. So yes, Wall Street is correct. But what they don't go, the next step is to say, we have to now incorporate that into it. And maybe companies need to start thinking about Vietnam, Indonesia, or maybe the United States to reshore and find other supplier outlets because China is unreliable in part because of their zero COVID policy, also in part because of the bad politics they have between the United States um, and Beijing. Jim, some of the portfolio managers and strategists taking the other side of the bet on inflation compared to you, they refer to the potential recession as a catalyst of lower inflation. And I wanted to play a, a soundbite for you from a debate between David Rosenberg and Raul Powell airing today on the Real Vision platform in relation to that recession debate. So let's listen to the soundbite and get back to that recession discussion. Because historically, the stock market puts in the fundamental low two-thirds of the way through the recession, whatever that low is going to be. Will it be 10% down, 20% down, 30% down? The major point is that instead of trying to pick at what point we bottom, it's more important to identify when is the start of the next bull market? Uh, when will that start from whatever level it's going to be? And historically, that's two thirds of the way through the recession. That is actually when people say that nobody rings the alarm bell at the lows. Well, actually, if you can try and time the contours of the economy through the lags from Fed policy, uh, you can come up with a reasonable approximation as to when, as opposed to what level, but the timing of when it's going to be safe to dip toes back into the risk pool, you know, outside of these intermittent bear market rallies. What's the fundamental low? The fundamental low takes place at the tail end of the Fed easing cycle and the tail end of the economic recession. So uh, that's next year's story, probably second half. The entire interview is available at the Real Vision platform for uh, Essential Plus or Pro subscribers to Real Vision. Jim, I want to ask you a question up front after this uh, soundbite from uh, David Rosenberg. Are we in a recession now, even if the White House refuses to admit to it? All right, let me try and be clear here. Yes, we're in a recession, full stop, question over. It's a recession. Now, you could argue it's a shallow recession. Sure, all right, it's a shallow recession. Check back January 1st, and let's see if it's still a shallow recession. This is not new, what the White House is doing, real quick. In 1978, under the Carter administration, there was an economist, Alfred Kahn, and he started using the words that if inflation doesn't come down, we might see another depression, and the White House went crazy on him. And so he started, he gave a famous speech where he said he was going to refer to it as a banana, and that he was worried that we were going to have a banana. <laughs> Out of that discussion came the word recession, because prior to that, we used to call them depressions. In the 1930s, the Hoover administration went crazy because we used to call them panics the 1893 panic, if you remember that from your history books. Don't call it a panic, what we're seeing. So they invented the word depression. So we went from to panic. The White House didn't like that word, so we invented the word depression. Then in 1978, they didn't like the word depression, so we invented the word recession. It seems like we're now in the process of finding a new word to mean exactly the same thing. My point is, my God, this is not new. We have done this now for 90 years between White Houses and recessions. So yes, it's a recession. Stop asking. It might be a shallow recession. If I'll agree with you there, but let's see in January if it's still a, a shallow recession. I, I other than that, I have no. Other than that, I have no opinion. <laughs> I perfectly agree with that assessment, by the way, Jim. And I can tell you from like uh, 10 to 15 years of experience as a sell side economist, it's not uncommon for investment banks to ban. Uh, the word recession in the economic research departments. That's why you don't hear it. Um, but if we look at what David referred to in terms of the market reaction to a potential recession, let's call it a potential recession just for the sake of our listeners. Um, he said that we need to get at least two thirds through a recession before you see the bottom in risk assets. Would you concur with that view? Yeah, I, I would largely because typically what happens is, as he said, um, you know, about two thirds of the way through the recession, the Fed starts cutting rates 
and the and that that's when the markets bottom and they take off and then subsequently after that the recession soon ends and his point is is that when we get close to the point where the fed is going to first derivative reduce the increase in rate hikes I mean we're talking about potentially going from 75 basis points this week to potentially 50 basis points in September that's too early in the process to be saying okay it's all over with now we can ignore it you usually have to wait till you've not only stopped the rate hikes but you've started the rate cuts sometimes the market will bottom after the first rate hike but before the first rate cut other times it'll bottom soon after the market after the fed starts cutting cuz the point is when the fed starts cutting that's when they panic that's when they realize we're in recession they got to do something about it we're not there yet we're still talking about 50 basis points in september 25 basis points in november that's what's priced in i happen to think that they're going to ultimately wind up doing more than that but even without that we still got 75 basis points more of rate hikes priced in for the next 4 months if if you look at the current market pricing of the federal reserve we have a pivot priced in uh, early next year actually uh, what are some of the signals that you will be watching over the coming couple of months to assess whether that market pricing is right or wrong? I think the big one is going to have to be inflation. And mm -hmm. and really, the way I've described it is there is a debate right now. And this is the heart of why the markets are rallying and everything else. Central banks and economists that follow the central banks will tell you the Federal Reserve is focus is on inflation. They have to bring down inflation. If your house price falls, if your stock portfolio falls, deal with it. They're going to stay hawkish until inflation comes down. That's their point. Oh, well, is there a point where there's a Fed put? Yeah, but it's got to get a whole lot worse before there's a Fed put. Wall Street, on the other hand, thinks the focus is growth. Negative second quarter, bad news is good news. The Fed has to stop because... Some home prices in Aspen and the Hamptons have fallen. I mean, home prices are getting cut, but it's usually the high end. That's why I said Aspen and the Hamptons. Um, it's not like, you know, suburban Cleveland that's wind up getting wrecked with home prices just yet. Maybe it comes to that, but not yet. And therefore, because that's happening, because the stock market had a bad six months, that should be the Fed's focus. That's what Wall Street thinks. So these diverging views are really at the heart of the debate. How much is the inflation fight matter? The central bank thinks it matters a lot. Wall Street thinks growth matters a lot. And then Wall Street will throw on to the argument, yeah, but we also think the inflation rate's going to 2% anyway. So even if they want to fight inflation, if they just be patient enough, they'll see it's going to go away on its own without anything to be restructured, and therefore they can stop. So these are kind of the debating points that we have right now. I happen to think, you asked me, what would I do if I was at the Fed? Well, recognize that the Fed made an egregiously bad mistake last year, maybe one of the worst ever, by using the word transitory. They should have started all this stuff a year ago. Now that they've already done that, the course that they have to take is to deal with inflation. And quick uh, idea there. Second quarter GDP nominal growth was 7.8%. That's a pretty good number. And everybody's pointed that out. But inflation was 8.7%, which gives you the 0.9% real decline. How does the Fed get us out of recession? They got to bring that 8.7% number down. It's not pump up that 7.8 number, that nominal number, higher. And so we are in a 70s type of example. We've got an inflation, we've got a recession. We have stagflation. Can there be any doubt we've got stagflation? Two negative quarters and 9% inflation. That is the absolute definition of stagflation. They've got to deal with the inflation problem. They've got to bring that down. Bring the inflation rate down under nominal growth. That'll give you real growth. That's not been the way it's been done in the last 30 years. It's been the opposite. They have to deal with the nominal thing by trying to pump up nominal growth by cutting rates to zero and printing money. We're just not ready to start to think that this is a different type of environment. Or to put it in Fed terms, we like to talk about the Fed's reaction function. We don't know what it is. They don't know what it is. They've never had to have a reaction function in a 9% inflation world. So we are still struggling with it 
both Wall Street and the Fed. But I do think it really comes down to which do you think matters more, the recessionary growth numbers that we're seeing or the high inflation numbers? Central banks think it's the cent- it's the high inflation numbers. They've got to tackle that. Wall Street thinks it's the recessionary growth numbers. Stop raising rates and you have to deal with that. Jim, I think the only missing link before we can officially call it a stagflation is a rising unemployment rate. But if you ask me, that's just around the corner. I, I wanted to bring up a chart on the housing market in relation to, to what you just mentioned uh, surrounding the risks to the housing market. Uh, and it is a chart showing the mortgage lending rate forwarded four quarters in time versus the residential price index uh, in the US. It currently predicts a contraction of around 5 to 10% in the housing market. Do you think that's a feasible scenario over the next two, three quarters? Oh yeah, I definitely think that you can see the beginnings. You're already seeing the beginnings, the hottest markets, as I said, you know, Aspen, Jackson Hole, uh, the Hamptons, you've already seen those markets really kind of blow off, Greenwich, Greenwich, Connecticut. You've seen those markets blow off the tops um, right now and start down. Higher mortgages are just adding to the monthly cost and that is going to constrict the housing market. Uh, so there's no doubt that is. But this implies, so therefore, what should the Fed do about it? Is the answer, could the answer possibly be nothing? That they have to, what they have to do is deal with the inflation problem. And if this is, if this is the collateral damage, this is the collateral damage to it. Um, and they, so that really does beg the problem. So I agree with you. Yes, the housing mm-hmm. market could be in trouble. But what what should the Fed do about it? And could the answer be nothing? Keep keep your eyes focused on the inflation issue. One of the sort of stickier components of the consumer basket is the rent of shelter cost. Uh, And if you look at historical correlations between the price index of residential housing and the cost of shelter in the consumer basket, then I would argue that there is a time lag between the house price drop and the actual uh, depiction of that in the consumer basket uh, that the Fed uh, looks at. If you look, say, 12, 18 months ahead, I'm playing the devil's advocate now, would a falling housing market lead you to a reverse conclusion on inflation compared to what you have now? Oh, yeah, it could definitely, that could definitely be, because one of the things that could break the inflation rate, other than a restructuring of the economy, which would ultimately fix it for a long time, is you break the economy bad enough that you kill demand and you bring down inflation. So yes, that could definitely be the case. Quick word about the shelter component. Um, the way that the, Fed, the shelter is about 40% of core and the vast majority is it is owner's equivalent rent. And it's what the word says. They try to estimate what your home would be if you rented it out. And they use that as an inflation number as opposed to house prices directly because there's a financial component to house prices. But the way they do this is they, they survey rental units. Now, rents don't change that much. So they, su- they survey rental units about twice a year. So every six months, one-sixth of the rental u- housing stock or the, the, the surveyed rental units get surveyed. This is a very slow-moving average. And we've seen 0. 0.6, 0.7 for OER, for the um, shelter component of inflation, and it's regardless of what home prices do for the next two, three, four months, it's probably going to stay very high. Once you start seeing those rents come down and it filters in, that's an early 23 story. But for those that want to say 50, 75 done, you might start seeing those core inflation numbers staying with a six handle like they've had for a while. And that's really going to push back against the idea 50, 75 done. But you're right. Once you get into 23, if you see some serious problems with the economy, that ends the inflation problem. You've killed demand, but that's kind of not the way we want to fix inflation by destroying the economy. But that is a way you can fix inflation. We, I would prefer that we recognize things need to be restructured and then we can get back to long-term 2% inflation. But until then, we can't get back there. Jim, we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. Um, and uh, we have a question from Jose and then a question from Ralph that I think we can mix. In this scenario with continued sticky core inflation over the next six months, where do you see 10-year yields headed and the dollar? 
Now, 10-year yields is a very interesting uh, di dynamic. The yield curve is inverted, and that is the difference between the two-year note and the 10-year note. I'll just use that one. The two-year note is 25 basis points higher than the 10-year note. That's where it went out tonight. That's pretty inverted. I, you got to go back to 2000 to find a period that it was more inverted than that. As long as that curve's inverted, there's a signal there. High short rates means the Fed's not backing off, not soon. But long rates are not so tied to monetary policy as short rates. They're falling. Bonds are rallying because of the weak economy. And I think that what you're seeing in the 10-year note is the weak economy showing up. And that's what the inverted curve is. So yeah, 10-year yields can stay down and stay down for a while. Let me flip that around. If for some reason the Fed were to totally back off and you were to see two-year yields plummet so that the curve uninverted and went back positive, you then risk the 10-year yield going up because then that says the market doesn't think the, the Fed is going to need to fight inflation. And if inflation is still a problem, then they take it out on the 10-year note. But as long as the yield curve is inverted, it should stay down. As far as the dollar goes right now, um, I think you know this, the story of the first half of the year was dollar strength. The dollar was strengthening because we had the highest interest rates, we had the most aggressive Fed, and we're the reserve currency. When everything hits the fan, what do you do? You go first hide in the safest currency, the reserve one, and then figure out where things are going to go. The second half of the year, if the fear or the concern or the belief is the Fed's going to slow down on the rate hikes, Europe is going to speed up on the rate hikes, the rest of the world is going to speed up on the rate hikes, uh, and there is a hope that, that loosening financial conditions are coming, then you don't need to hide in the reserve currency. The relative interest rate valuation becomes a little less attractive. The dollar will peak and maybe start to head lower. The canary in the coal mine for me for the dollar is the yen. And the yen all of a sudden is back to 133 after hitting 138. So the dollar strength and, the, or, and or the yen weakness is starting to reverse a little bit on this whole idea that rates are going to stay down, the Fed is going to maybe back off, uh, and that hope that we don't need to uh, hide in the dollar as much as we have. I can add that I remain firmly long dollar cash uh, seen from European soil here um, for what it's worth. Jim, it was a pleasure to talk to you this Friday afternoon. Thanks for joining. Thank you. I, I've made it my trademark to always conclude the daily briefing with a meme. And um, today I'm showing a meme of Jay Powell who basically clings to the transitory narrative. And I think he, to a certain extent, keeps doing that. Um, ultimately, Jim, what's your take on that? Oh, I think it, I, I think it's it's definitely right. Transitory has become the Baltimore of the financial markets. The word you're not allowed to say, but everybody knows it. it everybody knows you still believe it right now. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. It was a pleasure to host you today. Um, we will be back again Monday. My colleague Maggie Lake will host Roger, uh, Roger Hurst. Uh, until then, I wish you a great weekend. I can see on Twitter and on YouTube and all over the place that everybody's struggling with these financial markets. How the hell do we invest? How do we make sense of this world? It's too complicated. There's too many things. What the hell is a yield curve? What does it mean to me? How does inflation play into my portfolio? These kind of questions are really important and they remain unanswered to this day. And that's why we've done something very different at Real Vision. We've actually decided to solve that problem at scale affordably for everybody. That is the Real Vision Academy and the Real Vision Investing course. We've created this incredible structured course so you can truly learn how to navigate financial markets and become a better manager of your own portfolio, your own wealth and your own destiny. These are so important. The other thing about the courses that you find online, not only do they charge you a fortune, but it's basically done by somebody who's got no experience in financial markets. This is different. This is built by the head of proprietary trading at Goldman Sachs Equities in London, who also worked with me at the GLG Global Macro Hedge Fund, Lex Van Dam. We took his incredible course, which he trained people for the BBC show Million Dollars Traders, and turned it into something truly spectacular, taking it to when Lex never dreamed it could go. 
Now, Real Vision is always a little bit different as well. We don't make learning boring. I mean, we've filmed some of these videos in extraordinary places like bunkers underground to pubs. We want to make it feel natural, interesting, immersive. So when you come out the other side, you are a better investor. If you join us now, you get an incredible discount. Go to realvision.com forward slash the academy. See you there.